I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 198 of the Brilliant Balance podcast. Should you really ever bring your whole self to work? Well, hello again, my friends. Welcome back to the show. I want to start today by, I was thinking back on a meeting, actually, that we had inside of my company, Brilliant Balance, a few years ago. And it was right around the time that our team was starting to grow. We had added some team members. We were starting to get beyond what I could handle with myself and a couple of other people. And I think we were up to like a team of six maybe at the time. And I brought in a former colleague who had started a company called Noble Foundry. I love the name of that company. And he and his partner were there to help us develop a set of core values or operating principles that we were going to use as a team to govern our behavior. And they named this exercise, I Promise. So the concept was that we would be collaboratively writing these core values or these statements about how we would behave as individuals within this organization. The timing was so good because, again, we had been through this pretty substantial inflection point where we'd gone from, you know, me and then I had two people working pretty part time supporting me. And then it just started to like balloon and grow. And it felt like we got to get everybody on the same page about how we're going to operate. The process that they took us through was exceptional. I mean, I, I could probably have a whole episode just about that process, but it resulted in this written document that was an entire set of I promise statements. And one of the statements that made that list was, I promise to bring my whole self to work. And, you know, then we we sort of expanded on it to say things like, I will live in the freedom of being myself. I won't hesitate to share all sides of me because I know I'm loved by my teammates for the contributions I make to the business, no matter what my style is. Now, I won't judge others I'll encourage them to share more about their personal preferences and their lives outside of work because I know that when we're uninhibited, we will achieve the goals we have for the company, for each other, and for ourselves. So there, you know, the process took us through these kind of headline statements, I promise to bring my whole self to work, as well as some of the detail or you know, the meat on the bones behind them. So at the time, there were some things happening inside the organization that made this important. And it was maybe rooted mostly in style differences, work style differences and the diversity of work style. But today when I read it, it's the life outside of work part that really stands out to me because we all have that. We all have lives outside of work. In fact, I remember back when I was in my corporate life, right, the corporate chapter of my life, I came upon this way of starting a meeting that to this day is probably my very favorite way to start a meeting. And I would come into a room of, you know, very buttoned up corporate collaborators, everyone who was on my team, and ask the question, like, what's on your mind today? As like an icebreaker type exercise in the meeting. Hey, what's on your mind today? I want to tell you, if you want to start a meeting in a radically different way, that the responses to that question are mind-blowing. Because what happens is you break the barrier, right? You break the perceived barrier between what's the agenda of this meeting and what is really happening in that room. Because what is really happening in that room is you are collecting, you know, four, five, 10, 12 people, humans, who have full lives, where things happened before they got to work that day. They know they're going back to things that will happen after work. They may be getting phone calls or text messages during the day or right before the meeting that are affecting where their head is. You know, everything from I'm planning my grandmother's 90th birthday celebration to my husband is waiting for a call back from the doctor with what could be a really difficult diagnosis to there's something happening at my child's school 
to, you know, our toilet overflowed this morning, whatever it is, people are showing up with their whole selves. And so today that's what I want to get into is this idea of bringing your whole self to work. It's tempting, it's alluring, the idea of doing this. It feels like it could be important, but it may also feel risky. So first of all, I want to talk about what does this even mean, right? And then I want to look at what we think some of the risks are, like why we might not do it. And then I want to look at the costs. What's the cost if you don't do it? So first, let's define it. What does it mean to bring your whole self to work? I define this as showing up as who we really are. You know, being willing to talk about all of the things, including the non-work-related things that make us who we are as people, so that we have a prayer of building that human-to-human connection, you know, so that we have a prayer of really having our connections with each other be real and authentic and honest. This might include our family life. You know, it might include outside interests or passions or hobbies that we have. It might include challenges that we're facing. And it it may include things about our particular style. You know, if you if you think about even things like Myers-Briggs or disc training, I mean, they're really designed to help us talk about non-project related things at work, right? Team effectiveness kind of things at work. So these could be simple examples. You know, maybe you love country music and no one knows that inside of your work team, but that's what you rock out to on your way to work in the morning. And you're you're not sure how that's going to go down with the rest of the work group who maybe is all into a different genre. So that would be a safe example. Maybe you have a child with special needs and it is time consuming and emotional and you don't nobody on your team knows that that is some that's what your life at home is like you know maybe your one of your parents was just diagnosed with cancer or just had a stroke and you're involved in their care and it's new and it is time consuming and emotional and Maybe your your team doesn't know. Maybe this is one from our team. You're heading up an enormous gymnastics meet at your daughter's gym. And this is something you do to volunteer with your in, to be involved in your children's lives. And it is this huge project that you work on all year. And you're walking into this meeting and that's what's on your mind is that this meet is coming up and you're in charge of getting the equipment installed and getting all the judges in place. Uh, maybe you're getting certified as a yoga instructor. And you're super passionate about this and you're getting all your teacher training and putting in all your hours and learning so much about yourself and you're excited about what it's going to mean, but nobody really knows at work. Maybe you foster puppies and that's a huge part of your life. And you're, you know, so passionate about rescuing and fostering these puppies. Maybe you're renovating a home and that's what you go home to every night is, you know, tools and paint and sanding and all of the projects that come with renovating a home. Maybe you're in the process of adopting a baby and your heart is living outside your body waiting for that call, right? So many things that if you just close your eyes and imagine your work group today, the people that you interact with day in and day out, and ask yourself, how well do I really know them? right? Have I created an environment where they can bring their whole selves to work? And am I behaving as though I can bring my whole self to work or not? Because honestly, when I ask this question, you know, in our coaching community or back in my corporate life, the truth is most of us are not comfortable bringing all aspects of ourselves to work. There are pieces of our lives that remain hidden for a variety of reasons, but I want to talk about a few of them. What are the risks? What do we think could happen if we were more honest or more comprehensive about sharing our lives with our coworkers? One of the things, the the first risk, I think, is if you just ask yourself, why wouldn't I, right? It's that we are afraid we'll be judged. 
we're afraid that there will be some sort of judgment or otherization. Like we'll be on the outside of the circle if people know this, that this, this information about us will not be welcomed, right? So that fear of not being good enough, not being not fitting in, of having some kind of judgment levied on us for our preferences or our style or our situation is one. A second kind of caveat to that is that we could get, I'm going to say, pitied or labeled, right? If there's something challenging about our situation, something that could be perceived as a burden or negative or time-consuming, we, we don't want people to coddle us. So a lot of the people that I get to work with in Brilliant Balance are super independent. You know, we want to be like rock stars, right, at work and at home. And so there's this sense of needing to act like we have it all together all the time. We don't want to be pitied. We don't want to be coddled. So we don't want any accommodations made on our behalf. And so sometimes we will just keep it to ourselves, even when it's heavy, because we don't want anyone to pity or coddle us. That's not going to be true in every single example that I shared, but it certainly could in some of the more challenging or difficult ones. Do you ever find yourself saying, I just need a minute to breathe? While the whole idea of meditation can sound totally intimidating, I've found that stepping away from the chaos of life, even just for a few minutes, is incredibly restorative. So if you're short on time, but could use a few moments of peace right about now, listen to my five-minute meditation for working moms. It'll help you clear your head and come back to your day feeling centered and refreshed. Head over to brilliant-balance.com forward slash breathe. Press play and settle in for a few mini moments of peace right now. Then we get into sort of the work-related consequences. So those are more the interpersonal consequences. Some of the work-related fears or risks are that we will get passed over for projects or promotions if we don't appear to be fully committed robots, you know, who do nothing but eat, sleep, and breathe work. So that worry that we'll get passed over and someone who doesn't talk about a life outside of work kind of becomes the logical choice for the pro- the key project, the promotion, you know, the plum job. So I think if we go back to the roots of this, this is really, I mean, classically women were like, we are not going to talk about our families. We are just, we're not going to put pictures up of the kids. I gave you examples here that you know, I certainly didn't include, oh, I have children, right? Or I'm expecting. And I think we've evolved a long way to where we're comfortable talking about the fact that we do have families outside of work. But even at its core, I mean, I think we have a history of saying, I can't share that I do anything other than this job because I may be passed over for key projects or promotions or roles, right? And of course, the most amplified example of that would be getting fired. So we worry that if people know that we have, especially some of these demanding situations outside of work going on, that we'll lose our job, you know, that we won't appear to have enough time and energy available to do the work and that we'll lose our job as a result of that, right? And I... I'm not saying those fears are unfounded. We probably could collectively find examples of every single one of those things happening when someone shared more than, you know, is typical about their life outside of work. But it's only half the equation because the other half is what is the cost of not sharing? And this is really where I want to spend the rest of our time because there are very real costs to us as individuals and to the team if we don't bring our whole selves to work. Each one of you, is, you're going to find your own comfort level with what do you want to share and how much detail do you feel like you need to share it in. But there are real costs to not sharing, not bringing our whole selves to work with us. I want to talk about a few of them. The first one is that we're kind of living a lie. You know, we're putting on a costume and a persona to go into work that's like we're leaving pieces of ourselves at the door. And we're kind of living someone else's life, like this character's life, 
And this can really further fuel imposter syndrome. So a lot of you tell me, you know, God, I really wrestle with imposter syndrome. Like, I just don't feel like I'm doing this right. And if you are dropping your authentic life at the proverbial door of your workplace and going in there acting like the only thing you have going on is work, you are living someone else's life, right? That is, that's not the truth. And so that, anytime there's that schism between reality and the way we're projecting, it can fuel imposter syndrome and it's exhausting. It is exhausting to live that lie, to act like, yeah, I got this. There's, I have nothing else I have to do except this report, this project, go to this meeting, okay? The second potential cost is misunderstandings, you know, where you're just missing people because your behavior is best explained by the context of what's happening outside of work. And if you don't provide the context, people will provide it for you, right? Their brains, which are wired for story, will fill in the blanks about what must be going on and they will be wrong most of the time, okay? So let's say that you you know, you know had a doctor's appointment, they found something they didn't like, you're waiting to get that phone call and you show up in a meeting and you're checking your phone every 12 and a half seconds to see if that phone's gonna ring or a text is gonna come through from your doctor, You appear to be disinterested. You know, I don't really want to be in this meeting. You look like you're checking your work email or something else is more important, but there's no context to the situation. So that is a pretty straightforward example where there will be a misunderstanding. The person running that meeting or your colleagues will think, well, obviously she doesn't think this is very important when you do. But on that day, there's something more important, you know, kind of vying for your attention. So of course you don't have to share your doctor's visits with your colleagues, but recognize that as an example of the the absence of context can fuel misunderstandings. And misunderstandings erode the collaboration within a team, right? They erode trust within a team. Third thing, third thing that could be a cost of not bringing your whole self to work is paradoxically poor performance, right? Your performance could be suffering without context. So this is kind of the Atlas syndrome. You're trying to do it all. You're like, put it on my back. Like Atlas puts the world on his back. I got this, right? Don't worry about me. I'll handle all of it. But without the context of the other demands on your life, your performance could suffer. And that could lead to a poor performance review, or the real risks that we talked about of being passed over for a project or a promotion or getting fired because there's no context to support why your performance may not be what it typically is. I've had many calls with women as they are thinking about coaching who one of the things bringing them into coaching was, you know, I got myself into this situation where something changed. Maybe I had children, maybe you know, something changed with my marital situation or we moved or whatever. And my performance suffered because I wasn't willing to talk about how much my life had changed. And then I got a performance review and it was a wake up call. Okay. So I think that's, that is a cost that can be associated with not providing the context. Related to that is you could get a role that you truly don't want or can't handle right? Which can lead to overwork or overwhelm because you're so busy trying to prove that you can do it when honestly you can't or it's not the right time that you're digging this deeper hole for yourself in terms of balance or, you know, your own well-being. And you don't really have a way to explain it because again, you're not sharing those, the pieces of context that could help explain it. So paradoxically, right? You're like, oh, I don't want to get passed over. I want that big job. You get it, but it leads to overwork or overwhelm because it really wasn't something you were equipped to take on at this time, right? Or you hadn't made the other accommodations necessary to really create space. That over time, staying in overwork and overwhelm can lead to the next one, which is stress-related illnesses, You know, when you're taking on too much for too long, ultimately it will affect your health, your mental health and your physical health. And so there's very real sort of physical, personal well-being reasons 
for bringing your whole self to work. And the last one I want to talk about is missed opportunities for connection. You know, we spend a lot of our lives with our teammates, a lot of our lives. So many of our waking hours are spent in collaboration with those men and women that we work with. And if we don't bring our whole selves to work, we don't have the opportunity to be fully known by those people, right? By those humans. We have missed opportunities for connection. And we're all yearning for more connection, all of us. You know, we're living lives that are increasingly digital, increasingly we spend our time at work, and any opportunity that we have for connection is one that I think we want to fully exploit. So when we don't bring ourselves to work, we miss those opportunities to really be seen and heard and understood and to do that in turn for other people. So the net of this is, you know, pretending has a cost. Anytime we're withholding pieces of ourselves, our work styles, our preferences, you know, anything from I'm really an introvert, but I'm going to go in there and show up as an extrovert to, you know, I have really demanding childcare responsibilities, but I'm going to act like I don't to, I have something that's a big passion for me outside of work, but I'm never going to tell anybody about it. Like all of those examples are, there's a pretending element to them and it has a cost. So if you're going to make the choice not to bring your full self to work, you want to make sure that that's a cost you're willing to pay. So I want you to ask yourself, what do you think, right? Well, how does this show up for you? Do you bring your whole self to work? Be honest with yourself. Or what parts of yourself are you maybe holding back? That's the first question. If you don't bring your whole self to work, why not? What's your personal reason or rationale? And then the third question is, is it worth it? Is it worth the cost that you're paying for holding that back? I'd love to hear from you about this. If you want to share, you can DM me on Instagram. I'm at C Skolnicki. Or you can DM at brilliant-balance. Either account goes to me. I'd love to hear your perspective on this. So Instagram is a great way to reach me. You also can join our Facebook group and post a riff on this. Just tell us your point of view on what I shared today. The group is called Brilliant Balance. Just search and request to join and we'll get you added to the group. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on do you bring your whole self to work? I go right back to that I promise statement in my company where we say, I promise to bring my whole self to work. And here's why. And I will tell you, it's a game changer for us as an organization. I think it can be for you as well. All right. Next time on the show, I have a guest. Dr. Nathan Fight is the founder of the Cincinnati Anxiety Center. And he is talking to us about the near epidemic of anxiety that we are seeing this year and also about the art of letting go of control. It's a good one. So till next time, my friends, let's be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.